it's a place where I am safe because I'm around people who have the same disease that I have. Uh, it's a place that people have messed up and not asking for a second chance because we've all been through our second chances, Mary. We're asking for another chance. We're just trying to get through today and not worrying so much about tomorrow. Welcome to The Real Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Max Gershberg. The man you just heard was Jason Williams, the subject of Mary Carrillo's latest real sports story. And if you don't know about Jason Williams, well, you're in for quite the wild ride because his fall from grace was like few others we've ever seen before in sports. Williams' journey took him from NBA stardom to a descent into alcoholism and eventually to Rikers Island prison. But now Williams is trying to heal himself by healing others, including fellow NBA players now battling the same demons that he once did. You're about to hear that story in full, and afterwards Williams will join us to talk more about his life, the work he's doing today, and how sports, which once rescued him from a childhood of tragedy, is again proving to be his salvation all these years later. But first, here's Mary Carrillo's new real sports story on Jason Williams. For 53-year-old Jason Williams, this is just another day at the office. And if he's not hurling himself out of a plane, he's climbing into one, trying to learn how to fly it, or speeding across the ocean at breakneck speed. His office, you see, is actually a rehabilitation program he runs in South Florida, which uses adventure sports to jolt addicts out of their bad habits. We do anything that we can right here to take you out your comfort zone so we can get to the root of the problem. And do it while we loving them with accountability and empathy and, 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 and just have some good belly laughs. No sport is off limits, from racing across the Everglades to scuba diving with clients. What are you two about to see out there? Well, we might, if we're lucky, we're gonna see some seahorses. Nice. Down there about this baby, we're gonna see a couple of octopuses, and they got some great parrot fish in here. It's all about experiencing new, promising, and inspiring worlds. Here we go, uh -huh. zero, zero, two. There are more conventional sports here too, like pickleball, and a daily game of hoops, only fitting since before he was a rehab counselor, Williams was an NBA all-star. He runs his facility, aptly named Rebound, like an NBA team. His staff are coaches, his patients, teammates. I know over the last five years, I've been working on it. Teammates, since he too is an addict in recovery. It's a place where I am safe because I'm around people who have the same disease that I have. Uh, it's a place that people have messed up and not asking for a second chance because we've all been through our second chances, Mary. We're asking for another chance. We're just trying to get through today and not worrying so much about tomorrow. Which is why Williams spends every waking hour keeping busy. From his daily workouts at 4.30 a.m. through a 16-hour workday, seven days a week. I have to really, really keep myself busy because if I'm not doing this, when I get home, my mind, if I don't go right to sleep, can go to some places where I have caused so much pain to, to so many people that you will look for a, a release. It's not a healthy release. No. So if I stay busy, I get a chance to deflect. So my mind doesn't have time for me to process nothing but service to others. Before he caused so much pain to so many people, Jason Williams' story was one of inspiration. A kid from New York City who became a big time pro after unimaginable tragedy as a child. That began, he says, when he was molested by his uncle. He did something to me and my cousin, gave us some alcohol, and it hurt physically, it hurt. How old were you? Seven. And I remember me screaming from pain. And I remember him saying, boy, shut up, you're gonna get us thrown out of this hotel. 
But William's suffering had only just begun. In 1983, his older sister Linda suddenly fell ill. My sister was one of the first ladies to catch the AIDS virus in New York City. And she died in six months. And then my second sister, Laura, started using drugs and she caught the AIDS virus also. So I lost two sisters to an addiction. Despite all that, Williams became a star on the basketball court. First at St. John's, then in the NBA, where the 6'10 power forward was one of the best rebounders in the league. But he also earned another reputation. I was never an angry drunk. I was a come over to my table, let's drink some more, let's tell some stories, let's laugh kind of guy. What kind of drugs did you do? Cocaine. But that wasn't what got me. Alcohol is what got me, what kept me, what lied to me, what was good to me. It was whatever I wanted it to be. That's what alcohol was. In spite of his drinking and drugging, Williams signed a $90 million contract with the Nets in 1999. Little did he know that his career would end just a few months later. Williams suffered a compound fracture of his right leg. I knew I was in trouble when they were saying, get him some ice. And I'm looking down going, ice? That's my bone pop out. I was like, oh my God. And then from there on, I started crying in my beer. Oh, poor me. Oh, poor me. But William's life would only get worse from there. First, after losing two sisters as a teenager, he suddenly lost a third. My third sister, Roseanne, her husband, came home, had some drinks, and shot her in the face and killed her. For Williams, it might have been a painful but important lesson about the dangerous mix of alcohol and firearms. Instead, he continued to drink and indulge in another one of his hobbies, guns. Until one night in 2002, when Williams and some friends returned to his mansion in New Jersey after a night of partying. I went straight to my insecurities. I went and showed them my guns. Williams was playing with a shotgun in front of his friends and their limo driver, Gus Christoffi, when he says the gun accidentally went off, striking Christoffi in the chest and killing him. According to witnesses, Williams tried to cover up the crime by wiping his fingerprints off the gun, hiding his bloody clothes, and even jumping in his pool to wash Christoffi's blood off his body. I panicked. I don't remember to this day what I did. I just ran and jumped into the pool. You jumped in the pool to get the blood off? I don't know why I jumped in the pool. Probably because I didn't want to get in trouble because I was a superstar, right? I wanted somebody else to be in trouble. To be honest. When you get sober, you wonder, why in the F did I do that? Why would I do that? Why would I act this way? Jason, you think about Mr. Christoffi every single day of your life? Every single day of my life. Every single day I think of Mr. Christoffi. I see somebody get shot on television. I go to movies. I'm having too much fun. I'm having too much fun. I think about him. The uh, counts will all run concurrent to each other, so it'll be a five-year term in state prison. Williams was convicted on four counts of covering up the crime. He also pled guilty to aggravated assault. You were sentenced to five years in prison? Yeah. Did you get off lightly? Yes. Yeah, I accidentally took a man's life. He's no longer here. And being honest, probably should still be in there. William served just 18 months in prison, but his life was a mess. He was now divorced, estranged from his two daughters, and toxic to many of his friends in the NBA. So he gave in to his demons again. After everything you went through, why did you start drinking again? I started drinking again because I thought I got it. I said, I can be one of those people on television that can have one martini, but my martini glass was that big. And I considered that one glass. How bad did it get? I drank moonshine whiskey and dandelion wine. And I would just drink that all day long. And I was absolutely out of my damn mind. Crazy. Finally, after Williams made headlines for yet another arrest, this time for a drunk driving accident, he was confronted by two fellow New York sports legends, former Jet star Curtis Martin and former Knicks great Charles Oakley, both close friends of Williams showed up at his door for an intervention. I knew I needed treatment. 
I know I needed it, but as an athlete, do you surrender? We don't surrender because we always say we don't have a problem. But Oakley and Martin eventually got through to Williams and got him help in Florida, where his path to sobriety began, he says, when he finally started to take responsibility for all of the damage he did to himself and so many others. Love, empathy, and accountability. These are the things that help you get better, because there is no cure. There is no cure, there's just accountability. And you better be around people who are like-minded like you. William says that while he was determined to get better, there was one very important element missing from the process. When I went to treatment, I saw people walking around like zombies with no energy and no hope, no sports. People sitting under this tent, smoking cigarettes, talking about how many bags they did or how much alcohol they drank. And I was just like, come on, man. So I asked them, there's the old volleyball net over there. I said, is there a ball? And they went and bought one. And then we started playing volleyball. Just as simple as that, Mary. And it became competitive. Being an athlete again made Williams happy, gave him a sense of accomplishment. So after getting out of rehab, he decided to open up his own facility. Where being active is just as important as talking with your therapist. It's called adventure therapy. Every day he spends hours doing something fun and exciting right alongside his patients. Everyone from regular folks like teachers and doctors to former NBA players who have fallen on hard times. Players like Delonte West, who is currently in the program after living on the streets for the last few years. Or former Sixer Mike Jaminski. Jaminski used to mentor Williams when the two played together in Philadelphia. But last year, it was Williams' turn to help Jaminski, whose life was spiraling out of control. The one moment that really blew me out of the water was the death of my fiance. And then the, the thing to put it over the top was, uh, was COVID. And all I was doing, Mario, was drinking and passing out. And I'd get up in the morning and I'd start drinking again and I'd pass out at night. And that was my life. What kind of shape was Mike Jaminski in when he got here? Oh. His son Noah drove him here. And Mike probably went through a half a gallon of liquor on the trip here when they were driving from North Carolina. So when he got out, we could not pick him up, literally. He's seven foot of a man who's not well. I didn't think he would make it out of detox. Jaminski says he desperately wanted to get well, but wasn't ready for the kind of therapy Williams had in mind. I immediately said, there is no effing way I am jumping out of a plane, ever. He said, Jay, I'm not jumping out of no freaking airplane. The day we went to jump, no lie, it was like, what in the hell did you talk me into, man? We got over to the opening of the plane. I looked down, and the wind was just howling. We got over and jumped out, did a somersault. And then once we started to float, I was like, man, this is cool. Yeah! We kind of come in hot, you know, hit the landing. I was like, man, how can, you know, can I go again? I made it. That one singular moment just made everything possible for me. It just gives you the sense of you can do anything. At least it gave me that sense. Yes. And all of a sudden, facing the life of sobriety, you know, that it was an incredible help to me. So adventure therapy works. Yeah, um, I'm a huge... Huge fan. Jaminski left Rebound last September and has been sober since. In part, he says, because he talks to Williams and his staff every day. He also returned to work as a college basketball broadcaster. Mike Jaminski says that considering where he was a year ago, what has happened to him because of Rebound, because of you, is a miracle. He told me when he left, he said, thank you for saving my life. There's no better feeling than that. And, and it makes you cry. But the harsh reality is that many people suffering from addiction end up relapsing. And some die. Like former NBA player Lewis Lloyd, who overdosed on drugs after leaving Rebound. When you lose somebody, mm -hmm. like Lewis Lloyd, right. do you feel like you failed? 100%. I take a lot of responsibility. So it's a lot of me spending a lot of time with our life coaches after that, and them saying, Jay, we got to move on. We got other people. 
the other people, he says, are what drive him these days, not only to try and save their lives, but his own. Finally, at 53, someone people can trust. When somebody can count on you, Mary, is the best feeling in the world. That's where my peace comes. When you say, Jay, I'm leaving you my husband, I'm leaving you my wife, I'm leaving you my son, get them better. It's like, let's go, game on. And now joining us is the man whose extraordinary life story you just heard, Jason Williams. Jason, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. I'm grateful for that. So Jason, before we get into Rebound, I want to start by asking you about some of your backstory. Uh, Looking back, can you peg the period in which you first slid into your addiction? Was it during your NBA career? Was it before that? I think the addiction started once I got injured. I think uh, drinking started when I was er at an early age. Um, I had a terrible incident with my uncle um, where he took advantage of me. Uh, Didn't want to tell my dad because he would have uh, done something that he wouldn't have been with the family any longer. Uh, So I had to hold that in. And I remember being a young teenager and hiding uh, what they had back then, Max, you're too young, but they had 40 ounces. And uh, I used to take a 40 ounce or more liquor at a young teenager and put it in the toilet uh, commode and put the lid back on and drink it um, every once in a while when that would come up and I get anxiety or embarrassment about it. But I don't think my addiction really took place um, until I lost my structure. And that was once I got really got hurt. Um, I started uh, getting more out of control because once I lose my structure, uh, destruction comes right behind it. When that destruction you talk about leads you down this path and eventually to prison and you spend some time at Rikers Island, how does a former NBA star process that reality? I mean, what's, what's going through your mind, Jason, when you're in that cell? I'm very claustrophobic. Um, That was the biggest part of jail for me, was being claustrophobic, Max. You know, I would, you put me in any capacity. That's why I didn't wrestle. I'm a good fighter, but I couldn't wrestle because you grabbed me in a headlock and we were practicing on the 20th floor. We're all going out the window together because I'm that claustrophobic. Uh, So when I remember them slamming the door and then that second lock, and I would just ask them, I would beg them. I, I would say, Captain, please. Just don't lock the door. Close it, but don't lock it. I'm not going anywhere, I promise. But in my mind, I got to know I can get out. And that's what happens with, you know, when your self-esteem is low um, and you don't think you can live by yourself or you don't think you can do it by yourself. You think you need your marching band or your theme music or your entourage. You know, God provided me where I was by myself in Rikers Island, but I tried to stay out of people's way as much as I could. Um, and stay creative, right? You know, writing a book or doing something where it was productive. But understand something. You don't want to go to Rikers Island, ever. You know, so the next time you pick up a drink and you go, oh, the Uber, I, you better Uber, you better taxi, you better have a designated driver. Who, uh, because if you end up in there, you know, you're going to have to change your religion. It's a rough place. And the small spaces will really eat you up uh, and, and change you. When you get out of prison and you're still struggling with aspects of your life, we heard about the day in 2016 when your friends Charles Oakley and Curtis Martin stage an intervention. Take us back to that scene. I mean, how does that go down? Well, you got one guy, you got two different extremes here, right? You got Curtis who's been helping me uh, mentally and spiritually for 20 years. Soft-spoken guy, more you know what you got to do, Jay. What will Jesus do? Like he's pulled me out of places mentally that I thought I couldn't get out of. He came, he was one of the few people who came to prison to see me, you know? So Curtis Martin coming to see me, you know, it was that kind of of, of love. Like, Jay, we've been doing this for a long time now, you know, and he'll look at me and he just, without saying a word, no, I have to go to treatment. 
uh, because I didn't want to disappoint him. Now you got the other side of the spectrum, man, right? You got Charles Oakley. He was going to hit me with his baseball bat to get me to go to treatment. You know what he said? I'm going to do whatever I do and hit you as many times as I can to get you in this truck to get you down to Florida. You know, and thank God he did. And it wasn't only Oak. It was Charles Barkley who tried to help me. It was Chris Mullen. And then I went down, and after it was over, Max, I came back. Like when you come out of prison, you go, look, I paid my debt to society. I'm back. Can somebody, you know, can I hang out with you guys? Can I go back into the NBA? Can I get back to commentating? Can I coach at St. John's? And people go, hold on. And that's, you know, not yet. And it's been 20 years since my since the accident that I caused. Um, and you still, to this day, not that I'm rushing anything, but I'm, and not that I deserve anything. It was the worst day of Mr. Christophe's life and the last day. And you would never ever get over that. I don't like talking about it. I don't like bringing it back up. It's something that, uh, it was an accident that, but it's an accident that could have been avoided. Um, and that's what you have to live with. Uh, you have to live with that for the rest of your life. And how do you, Get through that. People say, Jay, you got to forgive yourself. And I'm not saying that people are patronizing me, but how I forgive myself, I'm still working on that. It's getting better every day, but it's my service to others is the rent I'm paying here at Rebound. For all the healing you've done, I understand some wounds that have been a, a little slower to heal have involved your family and relationships with loved ones. Is, is that right? Yeah. You know, my dad, the accident that I caused that could have been avoided is the recklessness the cowardness, put my dad into a stroke. He couldn't deal with that. You know, I remember sitting at the table and, and after the accident and that morning and seeing all these people around, I said, Dad, it's going to be all right. He said, Jay, I couldn't get out of bed this morning. And I was like, Dad, it's going to be all right. He said, nah, Jay, not this time. It's not going to be all right. And soon after that, he had a stroke. And then we got him back. And then after that, he had another stroke and it paralyzed him. And, and that was the beginning of the end of my relationship with my family, with a lot of things, you know, so it wasn't Max, just one person that lost their life that day. It, it was, it was two, you know, it was my dad has never, it's just something that could have been avoided, avoided. You feel like your dad. I'm sorry. Never, never recovered from that. No. He never recovered from that, no. And even did Mr. Christophe. So I'm not, just caused a lot of pain, man. Let's move to the present day. You're investing a great deal today in helping others with their sobriety. But is that still an everyday challenge for you? Are you still living day to day, Jason? Yeah, no doubt. I live, let me tell you something, Max. I'm, I'm tick, tick, boom. I'm, I'm, uh, I live breath to breath. I don't live day to day. Some people can do one day at a time. I do one breath at a time. I'll tell you something. I'm up every morning at 4.30. I'm in the gym. Uh, I got. I am what you see right now until 9 o'clock at night. I leave the job at 8.30. And when 9 o'clock, I'm in my bed and I'm exhausted. I don't have time to think about nothing because I'm under demand for what's going to, what time I have to be in the gym in the next morning. I got to do these things. Um, and they keep me accountable. And it keeps me going accountable, accountable, accountable uh, until you start getting your life in order. And that's what it is. It's structure and, 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 and keeping to your schedule. Rich, wash, repeat. What keeps me going is, you know, our family of rebound that look, and it's a safe family. And it's not a family of people who are perfect. We're all cracked, but we're not broken. You know, I have a disease that tells me I don't have a disease and we all get together and we stay together. And that's why we're very careful. You know, we don't advertise. We don't do any of that stuff. Like we really want to make sure you want to get better because when you finish the program, we want to, we want to make sure you to be a part of our lives for the rest of your life. If you attempted sobriety, Jason, through more traditional methods, more traditional programs, you think you'd be clean today? No. My mind needs to be active. You come here, you spend some time with me and my coaches, and we're very active. You know, we're scuba diving, skydiving. 
Uh, so today we raced a quarter mile in a car. We go touch and goes and landing on airplanes. We do so many, we do 19 different activities, different in 30 days that you probably have never done in your life. Number one, to take you out your comfort zone, right? When me and you talking right here, I could be anybody. But before I throw you out of a plane at 13,000 feet with our life coach right there, he's going to hear something that uh, that he needs to hear from you. And then when you get down to the ground after 13,000 feet, you're like, yes, you know, I lived, I could do it. I could, I can accomplish anything if I jumped out of a proper plane. So, you know, scuba diving, uh, skydiving, hoops, all these sports, they're foundational now, not only for your clients, but for you and your recovery. And it occurs to me here, and you tell your story, Jason, that in it's become your outlet in the same way that sports was your outlet to escape a really painful childhood, right? Safe to say that sports saved your life twice? More than that, you know, more than that, because uh, when we went into prison, I had to change the culture there through the grace of God. You know, uh, when I went in there, we went out to the yard, we participated in soccer, uh, we participated in basketball, and that kept people's mind off. So sports was a big part of prison also. Do you miss your old life in basketball? Would you ever want to get back into coaching or something like that? Or you feel this is your calling now for the long haul? For today, this is my calling. Of course, I would love to be with the NBA, but I can't set that example because there's people with me that would see that and they're not there yet. If I need in my mind, Max, to be in Madison Square Garden, when the most famous people in the world are playing in Madison Square Garden and they send their child to me, that's my Madison Square Garden. When a plumber that used to work on my house sends his kid to me, that's my, that's my challenge. It's the same thing. Like you're leaving me with your most Pride possessor, the thing that means the most to you in your life. And you're saying, Jay, fix this for me. Get this better. Then the challenge comes back in. Then the lights go on. You know, through the grace of God, I, I, I found something that I can do very well. And I'm sticking with that right now. Well, certainly glad we were able to connect with you and 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 hear your story. And, and let me tell you something, Max. It's brought me to a different level doing this, What you guys have done has made me more accountable. You have brought more energy to me. You have brought up anxiety and brought up things in my life that I need to work on more, my family, um, uh, a whole lot of things that Mary brought up in the piece uh, that my even my coaches, because I have to be on and bring it every day that they might have missed that I was trying to forget, you brought back up. So not to sound cheesy, but this was some of the best therapy that I have ever had because you guys spent a tremendous amount of time down there and digging in the places where I didn't want to go and, uh, and bring back up, you know, and it's been fulfilling for me. Well, glad to hear it, Jason. And we thank you again for, for coming on the podcast to talk more about it. Thanks, Max. And Jason's story is just part of this month's new episode of Real Sports. Also on the show, Brian Gumbel picks up the discussion we had recently here on the podcast about reforming the NCAA. He's joined by Senator Cory Booker and Tim Nebius, a former NCAA employee who actually left his job to become an athlete advocate and helped to spearhead the case that's now headed to the Supreme Court and takes aim at the NCAA. Soledad O'Brien shares the inspiring story of Oksana Masters, a young female athlete who was born with disfiguration, but overcame a childhood of intense trauma and defied the odds to become an eight-time gold medal winner at the Paralympics. And Soledad also updates her story on Hugh Her, known as the bionic man. Her's cutting-edge prosthetics are helping injured athletes who thought they'd never play sports again return to the playing field. You can see all those stories and all recent episodes of Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel on HBO Max. And that'll do it for this edition of the Real Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Max Gershberg. Thanks for listening, and please join us again next time.